This conference is on the striking relevance of St. Kateri Tekakwitha. My name is Father Miles Gaffney, the Vicar for Indigenous Affairs in the Diocese of Calgary, Alberta. Now, when St. John Paul II beatified Kateri Tekakwitha in 1980, he said that she was of universal significance, and he compared her to the great female saints in history, which he listed by name. St. Teresa of Vila, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Scholastica, St. Gertrude, St. Rose of Lima, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux. I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Then in 2012, when Pope Benedict canonized Cattery, he entrusted to her, quote, the renewal of the faith in the First Nations and in all of North America. Now, despite these strong statements and great events, we're still very much in the process of getting to know who this woman is and who she's meant to be for us. Now, it took St. Kateri Tekakwitha 332 years to be canonized, a remarkable length of time for someone of such extraordinary virtue and association with such remarkable spiritual events. A former vice postulator for her cause decades ago speculated I think in a moment of frustration, that perhaps the reason for this delay was providential, that it was the plan of God. Now this might just be true given the ways in which the figure of St. Kateri speaks with force to the times that we are in. She is very strong where we are weak. For example, uh, her determined pursuit of simplicity of life and solitude, the way she dealt with distractions, her uh, courage and patience in persecution, her advanced state of contemplative prayer, her singular chastity, her uh, focus on the world to come, and beautiful and holy death are just some of these ways. Now her penitential life, which uh, she lived out in a very different context than, the, than ours, I think could still be a positive example for us. Now in most of these areas we we shouldn't necessarily try to imitate uh, everything that Kateri did, especially given our state in life. Though we were all called to uh, pray to her and look to her as a model uh, with regards to these virtues. Now the Kateri Tekakwitha is in a privileged relationship with the indigenous peoples of North America is very well known. That is why we have the Tekakwitha Conference, for example. That she has become an uh, unofficial patroness, the environment is also foremost in the popular mind. Now, what I'd like to focus on uh, in this presentation is uh, those areas of relevance that she illustrates or that she offers to us, that uh, of which there has been little discussion or no discussion to date. I'd also like to introduce a direct connection that I think that can be made with. St. Kateri and the Divine Mercy Devotion, and St. Uh, Faustina Kowalska, also a subject of which there has been no discussion that I am aware of. In doing this, I'd like to focus uh, on the writings of the missionary biographers of St. Kateri who knew her personally. They interviewed her family and friends. Everything that we know about her is, is thanks to their sincere and well-informed observations. And because of the extent of their writings, we can form a very complete picture of her life. Now, unfortunately, these original sources are not that accept, uh, accessible. A few of them could stand a, a better translation or a, a good modern one. Uh, I think these, uh, these uh, situations uh, make it uh, are an obstacle for us in getting to know the saint. Now, a saint for tumultuous times. Now, Kateri Tekakwitha was born around the year uh, 1656 in a small village overlooking the Mohawk River in what is now upstate New York. She contracted smallpox when she was quite young. Her parents died of it when she was four. You may have seen her portrayed wearing a blanket over her head because she couldn't, her, light, her eyes couldn't bear the sunlight. Uh, this illness also forced her to spend long hours alone indoors, especially in her youth. 
Now, despite her solitude and illness, Kateri, uh, you know, she experienced the very same challenges that her people did as they uh, farmed, uh, hunted, and foraged, uh, sometimes in a very uh, harsh climate, in order to survive. She lived in a longhouse in close proximity to many others. Now, in 1666, her uh, village was destroyed by a French war party. It had to relocate to the other side of the Mohawk River, where around three years later, it was attacked by the Mohicans. This time, uh, Kateri had to head for the hills, as did all the other uh, women and children, until it was safe to return. You know, in, in addition to events like this, her people suffered uh, extremely because of the, uh, monument, the monumental upheaval that they were experiencing with the advent of European settlement. Dealing with distraction. Now, the 17th century did not know uh, uh, the great number of distractions that we, uh, we experience, especially with regards to the various forms of media. I'm speaking here about you know, unhealthy distractions or toxic distractions, not, not the everyday distractions we need just to keep our sanity. However, this, uh, this struggle, it's uh, you know, part of the human condition. The ancient world described ascedia as that spiritual disease by which uh, one is unable to give their full attention to anything of a serious nature for a sustained period of time. You know, back in the third century, St. Augustine coined his famous phrase, our hearts are restless unless they rest in you. In the uh, 17th century, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, who died just a few years before Cattery was born, took a hard look at the subject of distractions. He came to the conclusion that, uh, I'm paraphrasing him, that all of humanity's problems could be solved if we learn to sit quietly in our rooms. Well, Pascal came to the conclusion that we have so many distractions in our lives because we want to be distracted. You know, I could have told you that. But the point being here that uh, such unhealthy, unhealthy distractions uh, are, are things that we seek because they help us to avoid the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. Witnesses to the life of uh, Kateri Tekakwitha describe her, uh, her multi-dimensional personality. She was known to be patient, kind, sweet, lovable, but shy. I think her fatal flaw was her timidity. They also describe, uh, they all describe her tenacious strength of will. You know, she resolute, resolutely avoided anything superficial in nature. And even as a young girl, she was known to go out in public only if there was a purpose to accomplish. You know, later in life, when she was around 20, she had to flee to the Christian mission across the St. Lawrence from Montreal. And the inhabitants of this mission had a saying that Kateri knows only two paths, the path to the field and the path home. She knows only two houses, her own home and the church. Now, in addition to her inner strength, solitude, would prove to be a support for her in dealing with uh, whatever tried to pull her away from the things that she cherished. She grew older. Uh, Kateri increasingly became attracted to this seclusion or this solitude, which had initially been forced upon her because of her illness. You know, looking back, uh, we can see how uh, it seemed very much that the Holy Spirit was leading her, that this was a that fruitful solitude which gives one you know inner strength provides personal depth you know a time of falling in love with god now as i mentioned she when she went to this mission around you know around the age of 20 in order to practice her faith in peace even here with all the devout members of her community uh, her biographers describe her as uh, seeking to be alone with god and avoiding anything that might be an obstacle to this now, Father Pierre Scholenek, he was her spiritual director at this community, and he, he is her principal biographer. He writes that she was all on fire with the love of God. She loved so ardently that her soul heart's delight 
Her only joy was to think on God, seek God, speak to God, live in God's presence day and night. To God alone offer her words, actions, occupations, intentions, and refer them all to him. Accordingly, she took a special delight in solitude, alone in the cabin, alone in the fields, alone in the woods, so far as she could, lest her spirit be distracted from continual closeness to God by association with men. Now, while she had this great attraction to solitude, Kateri certainly had her friendships. She had a friendship with an older woman by the name of Anastasia, who knew Kateri's mother. Anastasia was the spiritual mother of the house that Kateri lived in at uh, the St. Francis Xavier Mission. She also formed a, a friendship with a young widow by the name of Marie Therese. They, melt, they met in uh, 1678 at the new church that was being built for the mission. They, were, you know, they met, they had a long conversation, they discovered their mutual interests, one thing led to another. And uh, Marie Therese became uh, Cattery's closest friend and confidant during the last uh, several years of Cattery's life. Now their conversations are described by the missionaries as being like spiritual conferences. Now the point being that these friendships, uh, like solitude and like... Uh, her inner strength, uh, served to, to help Kateri keep, us, keep her focused on the things that she loved, the things of God. Now, as will be seen, a sign of how focused she was on the things of God uh, was also how rapidly she entered into the heights of prayer. The Kateri was recognized by her Jesuit mentors as an advanced contemplative when she was in her young 20s. It was an incredible achievement made possible in large part by her ability to fully concentrate on uh, what she loved. Now an intercessor and a model for the persecuted. Our Lord says in the Gospel of Matthew, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This hopeful promise illustrates something of the trials and blessings that await all believers they're also part of our personal conversion. It also illustrates uh, how uh, this is primarily a spiritual battle, as illustrated, um, as, de as described, I should say, by St. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. Now, when she was opposed in the practice of her faith, Kateri responded with determined courage, love, and prayer. Slandered several times, she simply denied the accusations and she refused to speak negatively of her opponents. These are just a few of the ways in which she offers us an exemplary witness to the love of God in times of persecution. Now, the first persecution began, uh, you know, shortly after she reached the age of marriage when she was beginning to desire to preserve her love for God alone much as a consecrated person would. Kateri dressed model modestly, she refused uh, matchmaking efforts and the pressure to marry, all of which was uh, uh, revolutionary for a woman in her culture. Her, her uh, relatives were understandably bewildered. It would mean, uh, could mean poverty for Kateri. It uh, could also mean that they would lose a skillful, skillful hunter for the fold. So this, this would lead to the first of several persecutions that Kateri would encounter. Now, as, as a result of her refusals, Kateri was severely mistreated. She was uh, considered more of a slave than a family member. She was pressured in assorted ways. She was accused of not caring for her family, of being rude and disrespectful towards her people. I think that, that one hurt her the most, as she would indicate later in life. She was also accused of being stupid ultimately of having a sacred ha hatred of the Iroquois because her mother was an Algonquin. And this treatment continued for a long time, but eventually there was a breakthrough. And Father Sholenek describes how this took place. She behaved with such patience and sweetness, however, in the midst of these ill treatments and had such deference for her aunts and all other matters that she soon regained their affection. They spoke no more of marriage and let her live in peace in her own way without further troubling her. Now, in the uh, fall of 1675, a timely meeting set events in motion that led to Kateri's uh, baptism. The 
priest in charge of the mission in the village in which he lived, his name was Father James de Lamberville, was visiting the sick. He happened to find her alone in the cabin uh, where she was uh, recovering from a foot injury this time. She took this as an opportunity to express what was in her heart. He, in turn, was surprised to discover the many virtues that she already possessed. In particular, he describes her modesty, her honesty, her simplicity, her good nature. And in this initial encounter, Father de Lamberville was already convinced that the Holy Spirit had touched her heart and mind to follow Christ, and he began even then to begin to believe that God had great plans for her. After a little more than a year of instruction, Cattery was baptized on Easter Sunday in 1677. It was then that she was named after St. Catherine of Siena. Now, Father de Lamberville writes that her holiness was becoming so apparent it seemed as if the Holy Spirit had filled her soul with grace. He says, All the beautiful dispositions she had for virtue and that she had hidden from view in her cabin now shone with such brilliance that she surpassed all the others and in less than a few months had become to her compatriots a model of humility, devotion, gentleness, charity, and other Christian virtues. Now, it did not take very long for Cattery's exemplary uh, way of life to become a source of resentment for some. And she experienced a sustained persecution for over a year. People became angry when she did not work on Sundays and holy days in order to pray. They threatened her in various ways. She was deprived of food, jeered at when she went to church. She was mockingly referred to as the Christian. Children threw stones at her. Some tried to make, make her give up praying the rosary, but Cattery said that she would rather die first. A young brave with a tomahawk broke into her longhouse. He said he was going to kill her. The persecution reached its height when she was accused of adultery, but this was exposed as a slander for the purpose of discrediting her with the priest. Now, once again, Cattery responded to her opposition with prayer and patience, though this time its increasing nature began to weigh in her, and she was compelled to turn to the uh, priest for advice. This time, Father de Lamberville decided that the time had come for Cattery to leave her, leave her village for the uh, St. Francis Xavier mission in Quebec, which was something that a number of Christian Iroquois and members of various tribes had already done in order to pursue their faith in peace. Then after overcoming her fears about leaving, Cattery and several companions began their journey north, traveling approximately 200 miles over hills and through swamps to this mission. Now, in the fall of 1677, Father de Lamberville wrote a letter to the superior of the St. Francis Xavier Mission, where he says, Catherine Tekakwitha is going to live at the Sioux. Will you kindly undertake to direct her? You will soon know what a treasure we have sent you. Guard it well. Cattery the Contemplative. Now, contemplative prayer is considered to be the high point, the purest form of the prayer of a Christian. It's described in many different ways, sometimes as the prayer of quiet, the prayer of listening, the prayer in which God is acting and we're receiving. God is touching us. We're not saying, well, really anything. Now, seeking the gift of contemplation, and it should be emphasized that this is viewed as a gift, we can't presume to uh, just want to start contemplating when we uh, are engaging times of prayer. Seeking this gift was the primary theme as it crossed the threshold of the new millennium, that famous phrase from Pope John Paul II's uh, Novo Millennio Iniunti, that document in which he uh, uh, teaches what, the, what he believed that the Holy Spirit was leading the churches to as we uh, reach this new century. And the, and the primary reason for this was that so that it was, we could establish the spiritual foundation for uh, all pastoral activity and as a remedy for the growing restlessness in the world. Now this, uh, it's a challenging theme. You know, in every uh, everyday terms, you could say 
It's like uh, the, the fact that it's related to the fact that uh, talking is more easier than listening. Reminds me of the story of a, of a father who died. He left behind uh, well, his wife and two sons. One of the sons wasn't there when he died. This son rushed back and he said to his other brother, did dad have any last words? His brother replied, no, dad had no last words. Mom was with him to the very end. Now, the descriptions of Kateri Tekakwitha at prayer are exceptional portrayals of what this gift of contemplation looks like, offering yet another dimension of the spiritual life that we can turn to her for assistance. Now, within a short period of time uh, after she arrived at the, uh, this mission, uh, Kateri's advanced prayer life surpassed the expectations of the missionaries. <clears throat> Her reputation for holiness continued to grow among the inhabitants of the mission as it was becoming apparent that this woman was all consumed by a desire to be in communion with God. One illustration of this was her everyday practice of prayer. You know, the bell rang for the inhabitants of the mission at 4 a.m. Kateri would often get up well before this. She'd get up before the priest did. She attended Mass at dawn for the Jesuits, as well as uh, the Mass for the community that was later in the morning. And then she would return to the church uh, several times during the day to pray. And during her years at the mission, there would be many dimensions to Kateri's prayer life, including her devotions to the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. That was a very pronounced theme in the spirituality of Kateri, as was the, uh, well, the favorite theme of the Jesuits, that of Christ crucified. She also had her devotion to Mary, but notably, her mentors increasingly came to the conclusion that she was an advanced contemplative, reaching the heights of prayer in an exceptionally short period of time. After her death, Father Sholinik writes that she was a master right from the beginning, and she needed no other teacher except the Holy Spirit, so quickly did she advance with giant steps to perfection. Now, similarly, another priest of the mission, Father Claude Chauchater, he was more of a friend to Kateri and a bit of a mystic. He says that uh, she reached the unitive way, that is, that, is that uh, classical stage that represents the highest um, dimension of the spiritual life before uh, going through the, through the purgative and illuminative ways. You know, that's an exceptional statement. Um, I've never heard of it or any, any other f figure in the history of Christianity described in this way. But in any event, Father Shoshiter writes that her life at this mission would serve as an example to the most fervent Christians in Europe. Now, in their accounts of her at prayer, the missionaries describe uh, in many different ways the contemplative experiences of Kateri. Father Shulmanic writes, she seemed entirely unconscious of what was passing outside of her. In a short time, the Holy Spirit raised her to so sublime a devotion that she often spent many hours in intimate communion with God. She'd already reached the highest stage of the spiritual life and seemed to be continually aware of the presence of God. Even her physical appearance testified to this. Again, Father Shulnick writes, Ordinarily, she found herself so full of God and experienced such sweetness in this possession that her entire exterior shone. Her eyes, gestures, speech were inflamed by these moments. It was not necessary to be with her for any length of time to find oneself affected and warmed by this divine fire. Now, the love that Kateri radiated naturally attracted people. It was so evident during Mass that people actually tried to sit next to her or near to her, simply looking at her because her holiness inspired them so much. Kateri's entire life seemed to become a prayer. Early every morning she spent several hours in prayer. On Sundays and feast days she passed almost the entire day in church praying at the foot of the altar. She had inspired others to advance in prayer as well. Through her influence, her friend Anastasia, her spiritual mother, also advanced in prayer to the point of being lost in contemplation five or six hours at a time. Now, if Anastasia was praying five or six hours, what was Kateri praying? Okay, Kateri the penitent. Now, one way to honor the goodness of the human body and to respect it as a temple of the Holy Spirit 
is to engage in moderate forms of penance and self-discipline. Exterior penances undertaken for the right motivations leads to, helps us foster interior freedom. It leads to a conversion. Kateri Tekakwitha lived in a time that may have not fully appreciated the goodness of the human body and her penances uh, may have hastened her death. Nonetheless, at the same time, her uh, sacrifices bore remarkable fruit in her life. I think the question that uh, Kateri, the person of Kateri challenges us with is, uh, could it be remotely possible that our pursuit of a comfortable life at all costs contributes to our struggles with the body? Now, Kateri's missionary biographers describe some extraordinary acts of mortification that were performed by the inhabitants of the St. Francis Xavier Mission. These acts of self-denial and sacrifice, they simply call them penances in their writings, were all the more remarkable given that these people were living off the land in a harsh climate and following to a large extent the demanding routine of the Jesuits. Now some of the penances that Kateri personally undertook included scourging, frequent fasts, making food unappetizing by mixing ashes with it. <coughs> Don't worry, you're safe. She did this especially during Lent. She was known to walk barefoot in deep snow and over sharp ice, sometimes while praying uh, the rosary. She also prayed in the cold without heat. When her spiritual mother, Anastasia, told Kateri that she should fear the fires of hell more than anything, she burned her toes and feet with firebrands. When she heard the story of St. Aloysius Gonzaga sleeping on thorns, she did the same thing for four consecutive nights. This latter penance, however, led to Kateri's appearance becoming wasted and pale. Um, people thought she was sick, but her friend uh, Marie Therese guessed the true cause and she told her to speak to her spiritual director about this. Now on those occasions that the uh, missionary priest discovered that their little flock was engaging in, moderate, in immoderate uh, penances, they ordered them to moderate things. This included Kateri, who was asked by her director in several cases to stop some of her penances, which she immediately did, as was the case with the thorns, which she immediately burned. Now, Kateri and the inhabitants of the mission uh, appear to have had various motivations for undertaking these extreme acts of, of uh, self-mortification. Um, it's often speculated that the... Uh, natural courage of the Iroquois was being translated into the spiritual life, you know, just as they would have steeled themselves to uh, undergo torture and death in times of war. You know, now they, were now they were steeling themselves to suffer martyrdom. But in any event, what's important here are Kateri's motivations. Uh, she personally expressed uh, sorrow for her own sins as one of her motivations. What was she so sorry for? Well, she once told a close friend that her sins were, quote, not having resisted those who brought her to work on feasts and Sundays, that she had not suffered martyrdom, and that she offered fear death more than sin. Now, notably, Kateri also stated that she undertook her penances so that her body would not be the victor. O Kateri, the lover of God, the lily, the Mohawks. Now the word chastity comes from the Latin term costus, which means morally pure. This virtue uh, is synonymous with personal integrity and it's required for the harmonious union between the physical and spiritual in our human nature. Now Kateri credited her chastity to her devotion to Mary and at the time of her vow, she consecrated herself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. After her death, people began to pray to her for assistance with impure spirits. The official summary document for her cause states that Kateri's intercession was responsible for more spiritual cures than physical ones, and that those inflicted by impure spirits were especially helped by her. Now, Kateri Tekakwitha is called the Lily of the Mohawks because of the purity she maintained throughout her life. 
Father Shulmanic writes, I do not hesitate to say it is a miracle of grace. One cannot understand how she spent more than 20 years of her life in the midst of corruption in her homeland and then two and a half at the mission and still be a virgin in body and soul without having felt all this time the least thing contrary to this virtue, neither in body nor in soul. This, I say, seems incredible, but is nevertheless the truth. Well, Kateri secretly resolved to make a vow of chastity after witnessing some religious sisters in Montreal working with the sick and learning more about their way of life. Now, this resolution would be, uh, test, would be tested uh, as the subject of marriage reemerged for her. You know, even at the mission, this, this uh, subject came, came up again. She was uh, confronted about this by her friend Anastasia. Now, this time distraught, you know, you rarely see uh, our saint distraught, but this time she was quite uh, disturbed. She brought the matter to her spiritual director, Brother Sholanek, who cautiously responded by speaking at length about marriage, about virginity, and the evangelical councils. Now, after these instructions, he suggested that she take three days to consider things and then come back to him with her decision. So she said, you know, yes, Father, I'll take three days, you know, then I'll let you know. Well, Kateri took 10 minutes and came back to, her, came back to him, said she made her decision that she was going to uh, give herself to the Lord alone. Now, the priest finally consented to this. He gave her permission to make a vow on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, 1679, after receiving communion at Mass, she made her vow to the Lord earnestly asking him to be her only spouse and to accept her as his bride. Father Sholinik writes, It was in this manner that the great act took place, by which no doubt much joy was caused in heaven, and Catherine's greatest desire was achieved. After her heroic sacrifice had been made, she no longer seemed of this world. Her conversation was for heaven alone. Her soul already tasted its sweetness. Holy death. Now, there's a reluctance today to think much about the world to come, yet reflecting on death, reconciling with God, and praying for a holy death are some of the ways in which we prepare ourselves for our eternal destination. Now, union with God in heaven was Cattery's goal. She was overjoyed when she learned that her death was imminent. You know, you don't hear that every day. The miraculous healing of her face at the time of her death revealed how Cattery's hope in the resurrection was fulfilled. Now, as she approached the end of her life, Cattery suffered from various ailments, some, some of which, again, may well have been caused by her austerities. It's now felt that she may have died of tuberculosis, but in any event, in her last months, she attempted to drag her weakened body to the church where she would pray for hours. When Kateri was unable to do this, she lay in her bed, devoting whatever energy she had left to prayer and contemplation. She received the Eucharist for the last time on Tuesday of Holy Week and was anointed the next morning, Wednesday, April 17, 1680. That afternoon, she lost her power of speech shortly after pronouncing the names of Jesus and Mary. She died half an hour later, 3 p.m., hour of mercy. Shortly thereafter, some of the inhabitants of the mission and Father Sholanek and Shoshater were the first to witness one of the most public miracles in the history of North America. Sholanek says, Due to the smallpox, Catherine's face had been disfigured since the age of four, and her infirmities and mortifications had contributed to disfigure her even more. But this face, so marked and swarthy, suddenly changed about a quarter of an hour after her death and became in a moment so beautiful and so white that I observed it immediately, for I was praying beside her and cried out. So great was my astonishment. It was present, uh, well, they couldn't stop looking at her. They, uh, for a while, they weren't sure whether she was dead. Now, the Vatican's summary document for the cause of Cattery's sainthood describes the witnesses who observed this miracle. Quote, the wooded coffin presented by the French colonists because of their special reverence could not be closed before the whole population 
have been permitted to gaze again and again upon the glorified face of Kateri. Divine mercy. Now when St. Kateri Tekakwitha was canonized October 21st, 2012, a banner replica of a painting made of her by her friend and biographer, Father Claude Chachetier, hung in St. Peter's Square. The official summary of her cause published by the Sacred Congregation of Rites notes that Kateri appeared three times to this priest after her death, requesting that he paint an image of her. It says, in these apparitions, Catherine ordered him to paint her picture, and moreover, two simultaneous visions appeared, namely of an Indian condemned to be burned and of the mission church in ruins. These visions were verified by subsequent events. Now, in addition to the prophetic elements of this vision, the request for a painting was natural in view of the role images played in obstructing people about Christianity. And eventually, Chauchetier made a number of these paintings and sketches uh, for the purpose of teaching people about her life. Now, these images were also instruments of healing. As Father Cholinek writes, they contributed a great deal towards making Catherine known for being placed on the heads of the sick. They brought about marvelous cures. Now, in the world of private Christian revelation, there have not been many heavenly requests for an image to be painted. The only other well-known one is our Lord's request uh, to St. Faustina that the divine mercy image be painted. Now, in Cattery's second and third apparitions to Father Chauchetier, he heard a voice speak the words, in speech et fac secundum exemplar, instructing him to paint what he was being shown. Now these are the same words, the very same words in the Latin Vulgate that God speaks to Moses regarding the lampstands of the sanctuary in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 40. Translated, see that you make them according to the pattern that you see. Now notably, they are very similar to the words that Jesus spoke to St. Faustina on February 22nd, 1931, when he said to her, paint an image according to the pattern that you see. In his request, the divine mercy image be painted. And some commentators on the divine mercy uh, image have uh, referred to this passage from Exodus in uh, connection with the image. So why would Father Claude Chachetier hear the same words said to Moses thousands of years earlier and then 250 years later, uh, the same words said to St. Faustina. Is this yet another sign that St. Kateri Tekakwitha is a saint of universal significance? And given the development of devotion to the Divine Mercy in recent uh, decades, could it be another indication of her relevance for us right now? Now, at an audience, at the time of her beatification, St. John Paul II highlighted St. Kateri Tekakwitha's importance for the indigenous peoples of North America. He also stated four times in the same paragraph that she was of significance for the entire church. One of those rare figures whose relevance extends beyond the time and place and culture they lived in. For example, technology, supposed to uh, make our lives easier and save time. Yet uh, people today find their lives are busier and more fragmented than ever. In the person of Kateri Tekakwitha, we have an example of someone who defeated excessive distractions with self-discipline and prayer. The primary theme for the church as it entered into the third millennium was that the Holy Spirit was leading Christians to prepare for the gift of contemplation. Now, how fully this has been, this theme has been understood or embraced is an open question. In the life of the Iroquois saint, we have an illustration of what the gift of contemplation looks like and the fruits of this advanced form of prayer. Now, it's often speculated that Kateri would have entered the consecrated life if it had been possible for her. Now, whether or not this is true, the reality is that she lived her entire life in an intense interaction with the world even when at the Christian community in Quebec. 
In many ways, she's a model for the practice of the Christian life in the world at large. And at the present time, she is the only canonized laywoman in uh, North American history. Fans of St. Francis de Sales may be pleasantly surprised to see how his principles uh, come to life in the forests of North America. Now, the last century is considered one of the worst in terms of the persecution of Christians since the time of Christ. Um, such oppression, if anything, has intensified in this century. Now, Cattery's an example of patience and prayer and responding to persecution for one's faith, as well as an intercessor for those who are mistreated because of their religious beliefs. Our society needs to rediscover an appreciation for the importance of making sacrifices. Pursuing the comfortable life at all costs is not good for the, co the common good or for ourselves personally. Cattery's penitential life reveals the depth of her love for God and helps shape her many virtues. Cattery's healed, radiant, and joyful face at the time of death is a reflection, a small glimpse of the world to come, a foretaste of immortality. Taking this life seriously in light of the world to come was a constant theme in Cattery's life and the reason she lived life to the fullest, conquering mediocrity. Now, the first words ever written about St. Cattery Tekakwitha have meaning for us today. You will soon know what a treasure we have sent you. Guard it well. Is she too small a figure for us to accept? Is she too challenging for us? If so, the loss is ours. However, if we respect her as one more gift from God, as someone to come to know, to pray to, and look to as a model. Like all great saints, St. Kateri Tekakwitha will lead us to the mercy 